Hey everybody, this is Diliana Milleva and I'm excited to bring you Menopause Make Easy, a podcast designed to provide you tips and strategy to navigate the changes in woman's body, mind and spirit with more grace and ease. I appreciate you tuning in. Remember to like, subscribe and turn on your notifications so you are updated of each episode release. All right, let's dive in. Hello everyone and welcome for today's episode of Menopause Made Easy and I have amazing guests today. It's Rita Trottel. We met uh, recently in Paris in a woman conference and uh, you connect and I invite you in the show. So she uh, specializes in so many things. She's a nutritionist, she's a personal trainer, she's a behavior a change specialist. She's also a hormone change specialist and health food business expert. She also has published three different books. And today I would like to invite Rita to talk about belly fat and going through this transition period in woman's life in menopause and perimenopause why that's happened, this change in our midwine, and what we can do to help to take away this belly. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me here. It's really lovely to be amongst yourself and lots of other women who are probably experiencing the exact same thing that you and I both sort of understand. So thank you for having me and taking the time. Welcome, welcome. Let's uh, start uh, with What's happening? Why it's coming, uh, show up this belly? Even the women uh, make exercise, think that they eat healthy, and still that can happen. What is the reason that we have this belly fat around midwife in our midwife? The reason that it happens is actually based on evolution. So we might think that as a species, we've massively evolved in the last sort of few thousand years. And we have in the sense that we have created so many technologies. We've developed, you know, more convenient ways of living. Us now versus us two, three thousand years ago, drastically different. But there are a few similarities that our bodies haven't quite adapted. And one of the main ones for women when they hit around somewhere between 35 to 40 is that we all, this is across the board, whether you've had children, no children, is we start to spread around the middle. And if you think about it, 3,000 years ago, we'd hit, let's say, 40. And unfortunately, we were considered a pretty useless member of society at that point. We're not childbearing. We're not a young man. We're not strong. We're not fighting. We're not breastfeeding. So we hit a certain age and essentially were put out to pasture. We were put to the side of the tribe and left to, you know, dwindle away. So we weren't given food. We weren't given water. We weren't given sustenance or nourishment. We might at that stage only get the scraps. And our brain, our body's main function is to survive. Doesn't care what we look like. Doesn't care if we've got a large belly. It wants to survive. And so our bodies learned that when we hit 35, 40, we need to protect vital organs, things like the digestive system, the liver, the kidneys. And where are all of these? Well, they're around the middle. And what we would do is our bodies through evolution would store fat around the middle to keep those essential organs safe, warm, and still working. And it would take fat away from non-essential areas like the legs. The number of women I speak to who are in their 40s and 50s, we all call it the froggy look when suddenly all of the fat from the legs rises upwards and ends up around the middle. So we have this big belly and these little dwindly legs because it wasn't essential for our body to maintain heat and warmth around those areas. So we actually evolutionary move the fat to that area to protect what needed to be protected because we weren't, you know, given food or treated as, you know, essential members of the tribe 3000 years ago. Unfortunately, our bodies are still doing that, but we all have 24 hour takeaways and restaurants around the corner. So it's not exactly helpful for us right now, but hopefully it is helpful for the women listening to understand that there is a reason it happens. Yeah. And I think the, the adrenal function also and the cortisol level, the stress level, it's, that's also affect 
having some more weight in this area, right? Yeah, talking about the hormone changes, estrogen and progesterone start to diminish. That can affect also how you eat. You start to strive for the sugar more, right? What you can do actually with our diet. So cortisol, as you rightly said, the stress hormone has a huge effect on how our body is able to shed body fat. And unfortunately, when we hit the age of sort of 40, 45, we tend to have a lot more stresses in our life. We have more responsibilities. We have children that we're caring for, businesses, clients, whatever it might be. So as the stress increases, our body holds on to fat. Again, it's a survival mechanism because, you know, again, a few thousand years ago, what did stress mean? It meant tigers and lions and bears. Oh my. It, it meant absolute danger. Nowadays, stress means busy day at work. It means argument with the husband. It doesn't mean life or death, but our body still reacts the same. So it stores body fat when cortisol is high. And equally, when we start to hit menopause, we start to become more insulin resistant. Our ability to produce certain hormones in relation to food, so things like ghrelin, ghrelin being the hunger hormone. So it's what our body produces to say, oh, you need some food right now. These hormones start to shoot out left, right and center and kind of put our bodies out of whack in terms of knowing what it needs at what times. And the main reason the sugar craving comes in is because we're actually not eating in the right way for our developing bodies. So most people start their day with a high carbohydrate breakfast. So most people across the planet or the Western planet will start their day with porridge or cereal or toast, jam, honey. And what do all of these foods have in common? They're all high carb, i.e. high sugar foods. And when we do that, we have this massive spike in blood sugar, massive spike in insulin. It shoots all the way up. And then what happens, what goes up must come down. So our blood sugar plummets. And then mid-morning, let's say 10.30, something like that, we're in this sugar crash because we've had a come down from breakfast and we're craving energy. Everyone listening to this knows that sort of mid-morning, mid-afternoon, oh, please just give me a biscuit, that kind of feeling. And so we go and snack on biscuits, cookies, crisps, something that has a high, quick, refined sugar energy boost, blood sugar spikes, and then it drops. And because we start our day like this, we end up in a roller coaster where the blood sugar is going up, down, up, down, up, down. We're energetically depleted because of this. And we're storing all of this refined carbohydrates as body fat. So what we need to do is start the day with something other than carbs. And the best way to do that is protein. Starting the day with eggs, chicken, fish, think outside the box. How do they eat in the Mediterranean, you know, with the beautiful sunshine? And how do they eat? They eat protein and fresh tomatoes, these kind of things. So starting our day with protein means that we maintain steady blood sugar, we maintain steady energy, we're fuller for longer, and we don't store protein as body fat in quite the same way as carbs. So that would be the top tip I can ever give anyone to beat those sugar cravings. Start your day with protein and you'll find that by the time you get to the afternoon, you're not craving snacks at all. What do you think about plant-based protein? If the listeners are vegetarian or vegan, <laughs> what do you think? Absolutely. So we have to understand that the world is changing and it's going much more plant-based. And I think everybody needs to eat in a way that's comfortable for them. Now, for myself, I would never go wholly plant-based. However, 80% of my diet is plant-based because it's fresh, it's whole, and it's cleansing and it's what my body needs. But equally, the one challenge, and it's a challenge, not a roadblock, about plant-based protein is that it's much harder for the body to absorb. A lot of it is chemically produced so there has to be some sort of, if you look at corn, that's probably one that most people have heard of is soy-based corn products. There's an awful lot of processes and chemicals that go through that. And those chemicals have to be synthesized through the body, which again puts more stress on the body. 
And plant-based protein doesn't contain all of the amino acids that are required to build muscle and to drop body fat. Whereas if you took a piece of chicken, it has all of the amino acids in there. You wouldn't need anything else to complement it. If you took peas, which are a really good source of protein as a vegetable, you would need a pulse, a bean, as well as possibly an oat or a grain in order to contain all of the amino acids, which are really essential for sort of health. So it's not an obstacle. It just means that you have to be a little bit more varied in how you approach your protein. Yeah, because there's also protein in broccoli, in other green vegetables, in nuts. Uh, and also there's a study between how Western women are going through menopause and how Eastern women are going through menopause based on the diet. It's different because the Eastern women consume more soy-based products, which is rich of estrogen, I think, if I'm not wrong. So that's how, okay. how they navigate. Western women is more prone to use this, as you say, processed food. And this fast food and this all this that can affect the hormone, right? So everything that you put, it can affect our hormone in our body, right? Yeah, absolutely. Just what you were saying on the soy base, things like edamame beans, which are soy based, they mm -hmm. have really, really good estrogen content. So that's fantastic for if you're going through menopausal shifts. So how we eat has a huge effect, you know, even through the sense of the gut brain axis. And what we eat has a massive effect on how our brain then functions because of the nervous system that's connected. So, you know, completely agree with that one. And uh, also, I guess that is not only diet, you use a different system. And I saw these uh, pictures before and after of women, how a woman is before you work with you, and how they become after they work with you. It's a huge difference. So how you make this miracle? <laughs> First of all, I don't do it. Each woman does it for themselves. I think what we tend to do when we hit sort of 40, 40 plus is we slightly mentally give up. We think, oh, I'm too old or, well, I'm going through the menopause or, well, I don't have time. We have an awful lot of psychological limitations where we believe that we can't make radical changes in our body. And it isn't that I have a magic wand. This seems to be what all of my clients ask is, do you have a magic wand? And I don't. But what I do is help women break down what their limitations are that they believe. Because physically, a woman post 40 is as capable of achieving the hourglass figure, the six pack, whatever it is that she wants as a woman in her 20s. But psychologically, society has told her that's not possible. So yes, we need to look at physical things. So balancing hormones, yes, by eating certain foods that help with that, by looking at the fact that stress is a massive issue and serotonin, the happy hormone, as it were, 95% of that neurotransmitter is produced in the gut. Only 5% of our happy hormone is produced in the brain. The rest of it is completely produced within the microbial system of the gut. So it's how can we eat ourselves happy. And then when we tend to be in a much more emotionally balanced position, we're less stressed, we're less overwhelmed, we're taking time for ourselves, the weight starts to come off without having to really focus on it. Most women seem to think that weight loss is this really complicated art form. And it isn't. It's very simple if we can psychologically get out of our own way. So that's probably the biggest thing that I would say is I help women break down the root cause of the weight, which is more often than not a psychological barrier. So the key is emotional eating. If you don't eat emotional, you can dramatically improve your outcome. Yeah, you can not gain so much weight if you don't eat with emotion, stressed or you're in hurry or whatever. Exactly. Being mindfully aware of what we're eating. And I cannot stand the word mindful anymore because it is so overused by everybody. But it's being aware because the number of women that I speak to post 40, yes, the menopause, yes, the hormones, yes, the metabolism has slowed down. This is a big thing, but it's often because we've damaged it. So what most women do is during their 20s and their 30s, they spend 20 years putting on a bit of weight and then really drastically dieting. 
So they cut out loads of foods for a short amount of time. They bring their calories down to like a thousand calories, 800 calories a day, and they lose weight short term. But what happens at this point is our body says, okay, you know, she's not going to feed me that much. She's only going to feed me 800 calories. If I keep burning calories at the rate I used to, she's going to die within a few weeks. I better stop. You know, I need to keep her alive. So the metabolism slows itself down as a survival mechanism. And then we finish the diet. We've lost the weight. Maybe we're now 28 and we put a bit more weight on and we go, right. Remember when I used to do that diet, I'll do that again. So we cut our calories, but it has slightly less effect because now the metabolism has been damaged. So we have to cut our calories even more to see the same result. And when we do that, our body goes into shock again and says, oh, my goodness, she really hates me. She's really not feeding me. I better slow down even more. So we spend 20 years of our life cutting calories, cutting, cutting, cutting. And every time we do, the metabolism decreases ever so slowly. And then by the time we hit menopause, which has a natural effect in decreasing the metabolism anyway, the metabolism is so low that we can eat a thousand calories a day and put weight on because it's not having the right effect. So when we hit menopause, one of the biggest things is, yes, we need to eat in the right way. We need to eat foods that hormonally help us. We need to eat foods which don't build up toxins in the body, but we need to exercise. That is the biggest thing is you need to go and push against some resistance. You need to go and lift some heavy things and put them down again. It's about finding movement and exercise that challenges the muscles because that's the only way to redevelop the metabolism when we hit that certain age. So you have to push ourselves to uh, exercise a little bit because you start to lose these muscles for sure. And then it's maybe related to the slow down metabolism. When you exercise, you actually accelerate the metabolism a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. When you exercise, your metabolism will increase and increase and increase. So if I took two versions of myself now, same weight, same body, everything, and I ate the same. And the one difference was that one version exercised, I don't know, four times a week and the other did nothing. The one that didn't exercise, her metabolism would decrease, you know, every single week. It would start very, very swiftly. The one that exercised, the metabolism would either stay the same or increase every single week. So that is one of the biggest keys that we have to understand is you cannot lose weight or the belly without the exercise, but there has to be the hormonal balance as well. If you don't have this that you have this huge resistance and you just feel tired so much that you you know that you have to go to the gym, you know that you have to do some exercise, but you're just not motivated. How you motivate to go to do this exercise? So the first thing I would say is forget have to go to the gym. So you phrase it as have to go to the gym. If I say I have to go to the gym, the last thing I want to do is go to the gym. That's like telling children you have to do your homework. It immediately creates a mental resistance against doing it. So first of all, I would always say to women, how are you phrasing? How are you talking to yourself? What internal questions are you asking? Because the quality of our life is determined by the quality of the questions we ask ourselves. If the question I ask myself is, Oh, why do I have to go to the gym? I'm going to get a really poor quality answer because you have to and you're overweight and you've got a big belly and it's going to be a very negative answer. If I ask myself the question, how can I make exercise fun today? I'm going to get a much better quality answer that's going to help me. So I would always say, look at the phraseology. You know, the, the thing that I do when I wake up, because I exercise in the morning, that's the only way I can make sure I get it done. I wake up, sometimes it's raining, sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's dark. And the first thing I say to myself is, I get to do this today. Not I have to, but I have the privilege that I get to do it. My body is functioning. I have two legs and two arms. I'm not in a country where women aren't allowed to go to the gym. I get to do this. And that's a really positive way of looking at it. And the second thing, find exercise that you like. It doesn't have to be weightlifting. I enjoy that, but you might not. 
It might be that you like Zumba or maybe you like spin biking, whatever it is, you know, body combat, body pump. There's all sorts of different ways of moving your body. High energy music, silent with a friend on your own in a group. There's so many different ways that there is no single one way that you should exercise. It's far more effective to do something that you love rather than do something that somebody tells you will work. You hate it and never do it. Get up and go and Zumba. Get up and go and Salsa. Because if you love it, you never need to find motivation. It just becomes a part of who you are. Exactly. Self-talk. It's so important. You catch up ourselves with self-negative talk so often. So I get to do that, not I have to do that. And the quality of our questions determine the quality of our life or vice versa. <laughs> I love that. I really love that. And uh, if they want to remember one thing of our conversation, I can say that it should be that. <laughs> Uh, pay attention what kind of questions and what kind of talk you have. Be gentle with yourself. You just be gentle with yourself. What are you going to say to them to recap all this? Uh, a part of this, the quality of your questions determine the quality of your life. <laughs> so beautiful. Absolutely. I mean, the one person that always stood out for me, now this is not a middle, middle-aged woman, but hopefully it will still sort of resonate. Is you think about someone like you know, Robin Williams. Everyone on the planet probably knows who Robin Williams was. And to anybody else, he was this highly successful man, financially successful. He had houses, he had kids that loved him, a wife that loved him. He was in Hollywood movies, he was on Broadway. There's probably not a single person that would have said he was not successful, but he ended up committing suicide. Why? Why would someone with so much success in so many areas do that? Because the quality of the questions he was asking himself led to negative quality answers. Why does no one love me? Why am I not good enough? Why can I not do this? Why do I always fail? Why can I never say? These kind of questions result in such a negative way of thinking that we will never feel successful regardless of what the external world believes. But equally, I've met women because I work with homeless shelters as a in, in terms of charity to help women get off the streets. And I meet women who have nothing. They have no home, no money, no clothes. They have a sleeping bag. And that's it. By everybody's standard, they're not successful. But they'll ask themselves, how can I make tomorrow better? How can I strike up a conversation with a stranger? How can I do something so that I can get a job next week? They'll ask themselves really productive, positive questions and they'll get themselves into a position. You know, one woman that I now work with, she was born to a 13 year old and she lived her entire childhood in a car. She now runs a seven figure business. And how did that happen? Not because she was born into wealth, but because she asked herself amazing quality questions. So ask yourself, What do I like doing in exercise? What music do I listen to? How can I make this enjoyable? What friend could I spend time with whilst I exercise? Think about all of the beautiful things that you could bring into your life. And then you'll be that woman who massively exceeds her own expectations in terms of her body. You won't end up as the Robin Williams character who never sees success, regardless of, you know, how much you know money or time or love he has. How the people can reach out to work with you, Rita? So there's a few different ways. So we run different coaching programs, but probably the best thing to do is either head to our website, which is thehealthandfitnesscoach.com. You can email us, which is Rita, R-I-T-A at thehealthandfitnesscoach.co.uk, or you can find us on quite a lot of social media. So it's Rita Trotter. We're on Facebook or LinkedIn, or we are the Health and Fitness Coach on Instagram as well. But probably the best place to start, go to the website, healthandfitnesscoach.com, and just have a little look around and see if, you know, we we have some stuff in common. We just want to have a chat. And if so, book in for a quick 15-minute call. We can see where you're at and see if there's anything that we can do to help. 
Yeah, it's like I highly recommend everybody who listen now to reach out and have this conversation with Rita. Thank you so much, Rita, for your wisdom and uh, knowledge to share with our audience. Thank you, listeners, to be with us again. And I hope to see you in the next episode. Thank you for tuning into Menopause Made Easy. You can check out more episodes on Apple, Spotify, eHeart Radio, and your favorite podcast apps. Check out the show notes for any website linked to this episode, including where to connect with me on social media. I appreciate you tuning in. Remember to like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications so you'll be updated of each episode release. And visit me at menopausesupportacademy.com for all podcast updates as well. Appreciate you dropping by.